Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Meepleville Meets. Today, we have somebody who is probably has the hottest game out this year because of the current situation, and we all know what that is, the pandemic. And it's a fantastic game, but because of what's going on, uh, we thought we'd have him on the show to talk about his game a little bit and talk about him, too. But we are welcome to have the designer of Pandemic on the show this week. So let's welcome Matt Leacock. Hello, Matt. Hey, Tim. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. It's so great to see you. So yeah, so like I was saying in the introduction, I'm sure you have just been inundated with requests and talks and all that kind of stuff about your game during this time, right? Yeah, it's pretty timely. So it has come up quite a bit. Um, <laughs> given the circumstances, yeah, especially uh, when, when things were first starting to, to happen. Um, right, right, right. Yeah. So, so a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, I want to congratulate you because uh, on Board Game Geek, and for the viewers out there who may not know what that is, Board Game Geek is the largest database of board games on the internet, over like 110,000 games. It's, it's the number one source for board games in the world. Uh, but Matt's game, Pandemic, just tied or surpassed Catan for the most purchased game that users have said they purchased on Board Game Geek. So congratulations for that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I was really surprised to see that. I'm sure many, many more people own Catan than Pandemic. But uh, as far as like BGG collections are concerned, uh, I guess Pandemic's one of the more commonly collected games. It is. It is. And it's got to be, it's got to feel so good. Now, I want to ask you something about that in the, in, right off the bat. So sure. since you have sold just as much as Catan, uh, which, which <laughs> well. Will, well, well, again, yeah, we, we know, we know, uh, yeah, we know it's only people who've reported it, um, right. and I'm sure you wish you had that Catan money. Yeah. Oh my God, <laughs> Catan's a juggernaut. It's amazing. I love Catan. So. It is Good for them. Good for um, them. So that was my first Euro game. Now, um, I've always thought that. Uh, well, I, I'm going to tell you who I think are the four. So I think the four basic cornerstones or kind of starting games into the Euro world that I recommend to people are Catan, Ticket to Ride, Carcassonne, and Pandemic. So I'd like you, and please don't hold back, don't don't be humble or anything. I mean, your, your game is great. It, it is what it is. But would you agree with a list like that? And if you don't, what would you say would be kind of like the four basic good games to get yeah. started in this Euro gaming? Yeah, uh, it's tough because uh, Euro gaming is very specific. I, I would add something that was a little bit more party game oriented, like a Telestrations or a Code Names or something like that, which are kind of like Euro adjacent, I guess, uh, but also kind of speak to like modern hobby games that kind of uh, attack the problem from a slightly different angle. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of overlap there uh, with what I what I would uh, uh, think of as uh, the, the top ones that bring people in. Certainly, the most I think this is the most um, sold. Um, games in the in the hobby space, uh, as far as like the, the top four, right, right, right. And sure I wonder if it's kind of uh, closely behind. Yes, because I had asked Alan Moon the same question, mm -hmm. and he he had said the same thing about code names as well, because he thought that yeah. that. But but again, I'm talking, uh, and we might have to give it maybe a couple of more years because code names is sort of fresh on that list. Um, but games that mm -hmm. have stood the test of time and have sold the quantity of games to people and have also brought people into gaming. Right, right, right. Yeah, I would. Yeah, give Codename some time. I think it'll it'll bubble up there. Yes, and yours is unique because it is fully cooperative. So do me a favor, and it seems like the majority of your games, because again, they all stream off of uh, a lot of them stream off of Pandemic. Mm -hmm. Why you're so into the cooperative mechanic? Oh, I just love co-op uh, co games. I like playing with my family and. Um, I think part of it is just from the very beginning, it was just something we could play together. And regardless of who won, we all would kind of have a good time. Often we had a really great time if we had a catastrophic loss, uh, yeah. fewer bad feelings at the end, if someone was feeling very competitive. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, so that's that's one thing. I mean, that, was, that was one of the drives. The other is uh, I think they're just really interesting design problems uh, because you're basically trying to figure out how to make a cardboard opponent worthy of like three to four people's uh, continued concentration, you know, over 45 to 60 minutes. I mean, that's, that's no small thing to try to come up with something that's engaging as an opponent uh, using just paper and cardboard. So I, I like the challenge of that as well. Right. No, that's that's a good way of looking at it. And I could see how that would be a fantastic challenge, right? Because it's an inanimate object. It really can't sort of react on the fly or change its mind, right? Because its actions are sort of set 
or dictated by what the rest of the group does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you, how do you get the thing to respond if at all? And how do you do that in a way that's simple enough for people to sit down learn the game and not be, you know, get, get this wall of rules. So there's these two forces of like, you want it to be interesting, but you also want it to be accessible. And that, that whole nut is an interesting uh, uh, one to crack. Right. So I've got a couple of questions about that. So like my wife, she's old school, right? She, mm-hmm. she goes back and she can't wrap her head around cooperative games because to her, I guess, you know, like we, a lot of us grew up, there are games you had to have a winner. That's just what it was. Mm-hmm. So how do you help or what's a good way to get those people who sort of have that mindset to embrace a cooperative game so they kind of get the satisfaction that they won and not we won. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of tough. I mean, uh, maybe it's a matter of like playing the game and just losing catastrophically along with your teammates to to get that. Oh my God, that you know the game really got us. Let's let's try to fight back next time. Um, you know, I'm not not exactly sure what the right trigger is to get people kind of hooked on that. Um, or you might ask a rhetorical question like, you know, when you're playing a team game, is it okay if your team all wins together? Um, you know, because that's that's a cooperative experience as well. So you can try different uh, strategies. I think the, the best thing is just to get it on the table and get people involved and see how they react to it. Are, are they engaged by it or not? Right, right, right. And, and here's another thing. This is kind of my sort of dilemma and i'd like to hear um you the sort of the the king of cooperative games uh for lack of a better term but um so would you agree that in a fully cooperative game which pandemic is right or like your desert uh, uh forbidden island and all mm-hmm. they it's complete information correct yeah, yeah. Right there. well and, i mean all the players have the same information correct no, okay. right yeah. yeah so all the players have the same information so with that being said um First part of my question, is there, would you agree that there is an optimal optimal move each turn? Oh, I think there was actually a, uh, a scientific paper published on this uh, a few years ago uh, looking at looking at that very question, is there optimal play? Can you figure it out? Um, and I think they figured out it was an MP hard problem, essentially meaning... Uh, you can't prove that there is an optimal play, <laughs> even even using computers. So uh, I think the short answer is uh, no, there isn't necessarily an optimal play uh, for any given uh, move. Okay, I, I'm, so I'm not, I, I don't, I, I don't understand that. So what, what do you mean that it's proven that there isn't? Because I, I think uh, what they're looking at was like, if you're given a certain situation, can you predict what the right way to play is? It, it, in other words, can you say that pandemic is solvable in, in a sense? And uh, their conclusion was it's not, it's not possible to solve pandemic, uh, which I think you can back out and say, no, there is no optimal play. You cannot prove that there is an optimal play because looking at the math under, under, under the hood, um, it's not a solvable game. So therefore, there, there are multiple approaches. Uh, okay, no, I would agree in that. that makes sense. Yes, but 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 that's sort of talking on the whole. Mm-hmm. Let's talk each individual turn. So okay. for each individual turn, would there there be an optimal play or no? I I, I really don't think there is. I think oh, really? you might okay. find uh, some design, so some play patterns that. Uh, uh, work um, and there may be on certain turns um, more obvious plays than others, but yeah, I don't think on the whole you can say there is a single optimal play. Now I, I think far from it. Okay, because the, the second part of the question was getting to mm-hmm. the, the question, the point of the alpha gamer. Um, yeah. Again, for viewers out there who may not be aware what that term means, alpha gamer is the gamer who sort of takes over the game and set, you know it becomes the conductor, the leader, tells people right. what they do, and the all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the quarterback. Yes. So, um, should people like in a cooperative game like Pandemic, if you if you think every move that you have a great play and it sort of is the right one and people see after three or four turns, oh, that guy knows what they do and that girl knows what you're doing, whatever, should you say stuff? I mean, how do you hold back from being the alpha gamer if you think you have the right solution? Yeah, it's a tricky thing. I mean, it's it's related uh, somewhat to, like if you're playing a game like chess and you're a grandmaster and you're playing with a, a new player, that may not be the best play experience. So I, I think it kind of comes down to picking uh, players to play with you that have similar motivations. Like if you're all motivated for mastery and want to make the most perfect move, um, 
but you all want to do that. You can have like these really long engaging discussions where you're, um, you know, you might be like a team of rivals all kind of talking about different approaches. Um, or you might be more motivated to just kind of experience the game, let it flow and see what happens. And maybe you're not so motivated by um, mastery, but more about like uh, seeing how it goes and, and working your way through the problem. And if it's not perfect, so what? So if you have uh, someone from camp A and someone from camp B playing together, you're going to have uh, different motivations. And the game really can't solve for that. Uh, so one thing, I guess, would be to figure out, you know, before you get into a co-op play experience, if, you, if you're someone who likes to go with the flow, maybe you don't want to play along with someone who's like really going for mastery right. because they may they may say, hey, here's the here's the way you should play. And you're like, well, I want to, you know, I want to decide how to play on my own. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think part of it is like as a game designer trying to figure out what aspects of the design uh, do I really have control over and which ones do I not? Because I, I could put in all sorts of play patterns to mitigate that, thinking that this is a, a big problem that the game needs to solve. But fundamentally, it's sort of a social problem. And um, uh, I could put a lot of those uh, fixes in, but then it, it does change the nature of the game. And uh, it, it affects the game for people who like purely cooperative games, who like all that that dynamic group problem solving. Right, right. No, no, that's a, that's a that's very good. And yeah, because it's, it's just one of those things that I keep asking people about. I like to mm -hmm. discuss. I like to hear different sides because I'm, I'm, it's just something that I keep thinking about a lot when it comes to cooperative games. Yeah, it's uh, a really interesting question. So was your first one, was it Desert Island, if I'm not mistaken? Oh, the first uh, game, uh, co-op game that I did? Correct. That was Pandemic, and that was followed shortly after by Forbidden Island. Uh, came out, oh, I think, so, two years later. Oh, so Pandemic was first. Yeah, yeah, came out in uh, 2008. Oh, okay. So um, the reason I wanted to ask you that, so now that I know Pandemic was before Desert Island, as a designer, um, why or since Z-Man at that time, mm -hmm. Dev, you know, he took the game, was able to blow it up, and it became so huge. Did you offer Forbidden Island to them, or did you go to somebody else? No, so Pandemic uh, came out. It was a bit of a sleeper hit. It just kind of gradually rose up. Um, and uh, the the product manager over at GameRight had played it and really enjoyed it and approached me about potentially creating a card game for kids, a cooperative card game for kids. So Forbidden Island actually started out as a cooperative card game, uh, and I began the design after Pandemic was out. Um, and gradually it morphed into a tile game because they had to flip the cards over a lot. It's kind of hard to pick the car cards off off the table if you're doing it repeatedly. So it it, it you know morphed over time. Uh, but that was for a different type of audience. I mean, basically we're targeting at that at uh, kids and uh, kids playing with their families. So a younger demographic, lower price point, and so on. And so there's similarities between the two designs, but they're really targeted different audiences. Right. So essentially, you were commissioned. Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. To come up with a, a cooperative game for them, and that's sort of why, uh, for lack of a better term, Z-Man was left out of the loop, because it, it like you were commissioned to do this game. Yeah, I mean, um, whenever you're coming up with these designs, uh, I don't know, uh, you come up with a brief and you figure out who it's for. So, right, mm -hmm. GameRite approached me for this very specific design, and I came up with it for them. It uh, wasn't that it was actively trying to leave Z-Man out. It was just that they, right. they approached me and, and were looking for that. At the time, Z-Man was like one person, just Zev. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was very fortunate. I was able to interview him. So yeah, he told me all about the process. He had that one, two punch. Oh, great. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a fantastic time working, working with him. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So comparing the two now, so since mm -hmm. you, you're at the point, you've developed Pandemic, great success, and now you've been commissioned to do essentially the same kind of thing, but for a different kind of audience, a younger audience. What are the two differences that you're proud of in both games that you think are unique to each game? Um, well, I think, uh, so Pandemic has got a, lar a larger scope, it's got a richer problem space, um, and it's got additional complexity to uh, that kind of follows along with it. So it's got more to see, sink your teeth into. Um, it may have a little bit more replay value as well. I mean, you've got like seven roles. Um, there's all the strategic planning of setting up research stations and so on. So it's like it's got some more depth. I think that's its real strength. And then on the other side, you got Forbidden Island, which is a lower price point, lower age range in a tin. So it's got really interesting shelf presence. 
uh, fantastic production value, and you can set it up um, and play it and learn it uh, faster. So one of the really interesting things about that is I feel like I can hand that game to people who have never played a game before and feel reasonably confident they can have a good time with it because the complexity is lower. For, I'll give you one example. Like when you're setting up the, the deck of cards in Forbidden Island, you just shuffle them and you're good to go. You don't have to like create separate stacks and put epidemic cards and, and all that sort of thing. I could have done it the other way, but I didn't feel like this this age range would, would appreciate all that additional setup and overhead. So it results in potentially games where you lose on the first turn. It's not, not going to happen all the time, but right, that right. was a reasonable trade-off that because it's so much faster to play, you know, if you have a problem, well, just shuffle the cards again and go and go again. So uh, very different design centers uh, for that. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think that's the, the the big difference. I mean, one, one's a little bit more toy-like and a little bit uh, targeted toward younger players, easier to set up and play, and the other one's got a little bit more depth and expandability to it. Okay, so when now that you have three in the series of the um, Forbidden series, mm -hmm. Island, Island, Desert, and Sky, and you've got numerous in the Pandemic uh, series, going back to the beginning, um, when you make the second game, say De uh, Forbidden Desert, yeah, or are you making it to make a new game, or sometimes do you do things to maybe fix or make better something you may have left out of the previous game? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, expansions are and ex and like sequels are are interesting because they have different um, motivations, as as you rightly point out. Uh, we very specifically looked at Desert and said, okay, people have played Forbidden Island and they like that. Now they want to move on to the next thing. So when we looked at Desert, we looked at making the difficulty um, higher and uh, also looked at uh, create, you know actually bumping up the complexity. So it's sort of like, okay, you played Island, now you can graduate into Desert. Because it it's a, it's a pretty punishing game. You're, you're left out, you can die of exposure, you can be yeah. buried alive, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a deeper puzzle. Uh, there's a lot more combos you can do. So it was, it was more, I don't want to say it was targeted at the hobby audience, but it, it had more potential for crossover into people who liked a deeper game. So that was the motivation behind that one. Okay. And as you're going along for mm -hmm. Desert and then Sky, uh, talk a little bit about, if you could, to help us understand how a designer works with a publisher. Is it a lot of their desires, what they want? Because they, they're the ones selling the game, so they may be like, okay, we want this in there because we think we can sell more, the price point, all that kind of stuff. What is your relationship about it, developing the second and the third of a series mm -hmm. between you and the publisher? It's very much a conversation. I mean, if you take the, the, the uh, Forbidden Games in particular, uh, it's it's me talking with the product manager over there, um, uh, VP of product development, and figuring out, okay, well, what is the purpose of this game? Because what I, what neither of us wants to do is to come out with a, a sequel or an expansion that cannibalizes the other ones. We want them to stand alone, right? So you can pick those things up and play them. But also, uh, you want players to be able to say how they're different. So island was this entry level version desert is a little crunchier um you know bleeds over into hobby space a little bit more and then the big challenge is okay well if we're going to do another one what, what is it going to be it'd be fairly easy to come up with another desert like um uh, uh sequel like set in another place we could have done something like an i don't know called forbidden forest or something like that um and had a similar puzzle to desert but then the two just kind of almost directly compete. Uh, so the, the trick for, for a long time was, well, how am I gonna come up with something for the third game that sets itself apart? And that's where I started playing with the, the componentry and looking at a puzzle um, and also looking at the way the, the board develops and, and trying to come up with differences so that people can go, okay, island works like this, desert works like this, and um, sky has got this other feel to it to, that sets it apart. Right. And that sort of happened the same thing with Pandemic because you had the base and then, of course, you made like expansions and contagion and, and things like that. Um, but the sort of and uh, again, I'm sorry because there's so many and I don't know if <laughs> yeah. I'm getting the timeline messed up. But was Iberia kind of there was a special big one where you you went back a whole era to really change the skin? In my yeah, I mean, Pandemic was kind of all sorts of different directions. So there's the base right. game, then you can expand that. And then we took it and we put it in different country settings, historical settings. And then we got the legacy series. And so we're basically trying to find different audiences that can jump on board with it. 
Um, Iberia in particular was uh, done, the, the original idea was we would come up with a um, sort of a localized version of Pandemic, uh, one per year and make it a collector series. And we, we've moved away from that. Now all those things will be in reprints uh, because they were really popular, a lot more popular than we thought they would be. Um, so I, you shouldn't expect to see Iberia uh, go out of print. But the idea, what, initial idea was, oh, we're going to have the Pandemic uh, Survival World Championship in Spain. Why don't we make a game set in Spain? And then we're going to do it in Amsterdam. Why don't we set one in, you know, in, in uh, the Netherlands um, and so on? We had one set in Italy, so we did Fall of Rome. Um, so that was, that was the initial uh, conceit. Uh, but gradually, uh, that kind of has become its own thing now. Now those are called pandemic system games. They're they're games that use the pandemic engine um, and are just have different settings. Right, right, right. Because I know like Rising Tide is with the water. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have yeah, and and, that, and that's fantastic. So um, now maybe just a little bit more information exactly how Matt Leacock. Um, the entity works. So <laughs> and what, and what I mean by that is, 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 is it, is it just you to develop and continue and work on the games or because there is like Catan studio, right? They have mm -hmm. like a studio who does the games. I don't know how much Klaus Tuber even does anymore, but how involved are you? Or is there, what is the Matt Leacock uh, entity like in designing games? Yeah. Uh, so anything with my name on it, I'm involved in. Um, and actually anything with the pandemic label on, I'm reviewing. Uh, so if you see the pandemic trademark on it, I'm, I'm checking it out, making sure it's, it's cool. Um, but to answer your, your question more directly, um, I often do sort of the, the core game, initial core games, like if something is brand new, uh, whether it's a uh, pandemic or pandemic hot zone or pandemic, the cure, um, those I've traditionally done sort of on my own. And then when I go to expand or do, um, for the, the survival series, the one set in like um, Iberia and Rising Tide and Fall of Rome, and for all the legacy stuff uh, and all the expansions, I've, I've taken on a co-designer. Um, I really enjoy working with other people. They bring in lots of fresh ideas. We, you know, work in different ways. I learn a lot of stuff. So, um, it's sort of a long-winded way of saying I, I do some of it by myself, and a lot of it I do with a co-designer, uh, and that's just for the game design, right? So we get uh -huh. it to. Um, designed and, and mostly developed. And then that's handed over to the Z-Man Studios and they do the, you know, like the last mile of development. Um, they do all the graphic design and editing and all that kind of stuff. So they, they bring the design and turn it into a product. Right, right, right. And speaking of, that's a good transition point because you do say you work with several um, collaborators, uh, yeah. co-designers. And I was very fortunate. I uh, interviewed Rob Davio and uh, he spoke very highly of the relationship that you two had that, you know, again, he's worked with several collaborators, different ones you have too, but he said there was just something really special about you two when you came together that you were able to do these. So if you could, I'd like to hear your viewpoint on why that was such a very special because, you know, uh, and again, don't be humble. I mean, pandemic, <laughs> legacy, no, and pandemic legacy is, is just phenomenal. You guys, you guys just did. It was phenomenal. So, he brought his sort of expertise with like the legacy because he, you know, risk legacy he had done. The mm -hmm. You had the pandemic skeleton, as you could say, or the, the core, the base. So why was your relationship so special? Well, I think we just hit it off really well. Um, and we worked together very well uh, to begin with. We trusted each other quite a bit too. Uh, we both respected each other. Uh, we both talked a lot. Um, we live on opposite coasts, so there's like 3,000 miles between us, but we made it a point to get together over video um, on a weekly or, you know, even more frequent basis. Um, we found a good workflow. Um, I, we had very complementary skill sets. Uh, Rob's got this great storytelling background, um, very good at improvisational design. And I come from more of a user experience design background, so I could bring some human factor stuff in there and uh, some of the workflow that I learned uh, on the job here in Silicon Valley. Uh, so we, we just had all this stuff that kind of fit together really well. And um, I, in, more than anything, really had a good time working on this stuff together. Um, right. And there had to be, so, and, and again, it's, it's, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, not like I'm looking for dirt, but there had to be, <laughs> no, but what I mean is there had to be like some things where you're like, I just don't think that's a good idea, but they really feel strongly about it. So, okay, let's go with it. And you're, then you're like, wow, 
Okay, that surprised me because I never thought that were, were, would work. W were there maybe a couple of things that you can maybe think of just to share that that you just didn't think were good or maybe he didn't think were good and then you found out, yeah, that was absolutely right. Yeah, I'm kind of sorry to disappoint you. There weren't a whole lot of those. I mean, I, I can okay. think of some with other co-designers where we're like, okay, well, I'm going to you know grin and bear it and you know bite my tongue and we'll just right. say, hey, you know, sometimes you just have to, uh, I have to be really careful because often I'm I'm doing a lot of the lifting on the, the prototype creation, and I don't want to be a censor and say I don't like that idea, so I'm not going to draw it. You know, so mm -hmm. I, I catch myself sometimes uh, thinking that, and I go like, no, I got to draw this up. We got to test it and see what the data shows us. But there's very little of that with Rob. I mean, I, I think um, occasionally there'd be something where, more than anything, maybe is we'd go too deep on something that didn't matter. And the other person would just have to say, hey, look, you know what? Why don't you come up for air? This just doesn't matter. <laughs> let's, let's defer that. Or wow. you let someone just kind of run with it. You're like, OK, fine. You know, do your thing. We'll get it right. down there. We'll see how it, uh, see how it works in play testing. Because at the end of the day, we did a lot of testing. And the test, and, yeah. you know, the play test just would let us know what was working and what wasn't. Right. Now, was there a point or like, OK, so say, you know, 100 um, percent is when the game has been finalized by the studio, this or that. Zero is just the initial idea. So at what percentage point was there a point? It, was there a point where you were like, wow, I, th I think we've got something special here. Did that ever happen? Yeah, I think it was. Um, so you've been to the Gathering of Friends, right? I mean, uh -huh, we, yeah. we brought uh, season one to the Gathering and uh, actually watched people play test it in in the room. Uh, we do a lot of video remote testing, but it, at this particular time, we um, for both seasons one, two, and and zero, we we brought uh, kits to test there. Uh, for uh, one time with season two, I think we had three <laughs> tests going simultaneously. Um, but yeah, I mean, just getting that feedback from players and just watching them get super excited and just seeing the emotional intensity that they were carrying uh, was an indicator that we may be onto something pretty pretty special here. Yeah, and and one of the interesting things, like I, I had brought up with Rob, um, and I'd like your thoughts on it too, is I, the the experience. And again, I'm, it's not a bad thing. It's just it's just weird to me because the experience of the game was so overpowering to me. Um, that I spent more time being in awe of what you had pulled off and being like, I can't believe they did that. How did they think of that? Oh my God, that's amazing. Then the actual gameplay, you, you know what I mean? So oh, okay. right. it, it, it was just, it was, it was a weird experience for me because I, I was just, I, it was just so great. It was just a wonderful experience. So do you think of that or have you been approached with that? Or how do you think, of course, games should be an experiential uh, an event, right? I mean, you're supposed to enjoy it and everything like that, but mm -hmm. is it supposed to overpower the game? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, it certainly wasn't our intention to create something so finely crafted right. that people would be distracted by it. Uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I've I've uh, I've read really finely crafted uh, novels where you get to the end, you're like, how do they how do they do that? I, I'm just delighted that people think that uh, of our our product. That was definitely not something that we set out to do. I mean, we're, we're happy that. Uh, I, don't, I don't speak for Rob. Um, happy that uh, it was received as, as well as it was. Oh, yeah. And it, it seems like uh, at least the arc. And again, I haven't played two yet. I, mm -hmm. I haven't even played zero. Uh, I just played one. And again, it was, was absolutely phenomenal. But it seems the arc was, uh, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe what you've read or heard for reviews and all this kind of stuff, that Pandemic Legacy, of course, was on its high. Season one, I mean, season two maybe dipped a tiny bit below one. But now zero has surpassed even one as far as the feedback coming back. Is that accurate? Uh, I only have a few data points. I mean, it, I'm encouraged by the early reviews. Um, uh -huh. So, uh, but you know, it's it's only a few few early reviews. So we'll see. I mean, it, we'll see how uh, uh, when when more feedback comes in. Um, I'll take it. You know, if people are really enjoying it more than, even more than one, that's that's wonderful. I mean, that's it's tough doing trilogies. I mean, the third one is is tough to stick. You know, try to stick the landing on. So, oh, of course, um, people yeah. love it. I, I, I'll be be delighted. Yeah, and of course, everybody goes back to the Godfather, right? Like, yeah, right. One, one and two are phenomenal, and three. Yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Just dipped a little bit. So, right. um, do you have any plans? I don't know if you can maybe uh, tell us at all, um, but since this is such a, a really cool thing, do you have any plans of taking it elsewhere? And what I mean by that is with a skin. So this was basically humans uh in the world 
Um, now you can either maybe go back a couple hundred years like you did in Iberia, or you can maybe have a Cthulhu thing with monsters or space. Is there any thought or chance of maybe legacies coming out in different skins? Uh, no, no current plans, really. I mean, these are these are really tough to, to pull off. It, they're quite a marathon. And each one that we did was uh, harder um, than the last one because we don't want to, like, repeat ourselves and want to... Uh, you know, we want, the, we want the experience to be samey and so on. And simply like taking something we'd already done before and reskinning it, I, don't, I think it's kind of a disservice. It was something that I, I really want to make sure with every single pandemic pe product was it it could stand on its on its own. So, but the real answer is I, I'm just kind of tired. Uh, they're they're uh, they take a lot of energy, and Rob and I were able to do three, knowing that there would only be three. So um, never say never, but it's not something that I'll be looking to do in the in the very short term. Right. And one of the, again, um, I um, unfortunately haven't had a chance to even, you know, review it or do anything, but I have, you know, been watching things and hearing reviews. And one of the things that I have heard is that it's, there's a new, and again, I know you can't talk a whole lot, but the, the question is, is I've heard there is a new sort of way to play. Like it's, it's, you have to learn the new way of playing pandemic. What was, if, if that's true, and I, cause I may have misunderstood what was your reasoning or decision to sort of change the gameplay? Yeah, season two plays differently than one, and season uh, zero plays differently than one and, and two, but not in dramatic ways. Um, I mean, if you've played any of the pandemic games, it's a very similar action point allowance sort of thing. You you take your four actions, you draw two cards, and then the game reacts, and they all follow that kind of pattern. What we didn't want to do is just to have the same game over and over and over again. So season two kind of inverts things. So um, cubes are good. Uh, they represent supplies that you need to, to, to distribute around the world in order to prevent the outbreaks of disease. Uh, season zero um, takes place in the, in the Cold War in 1962. And there is no disease at the very beginning. You're um, freshly recruited uh, out of medical school to be a uh, spy. Um, and you're going to investigate um, a bioweapon that the Soviets are, are developing. And basically, you're, you're um, moving around the world trying to complete objectives. And in the, in the process, you're, you're fighting against um, uh, Soviet agents who are trying to blow your cover or create these incidents from happening. And so that's got a different feel as well. We had to change certain things. Like agents don't tend to like multiply when they congregate. There's no, okay. you know, outbreaks work differently. And Right. And you, you're not discovering a cure, so the melding works differently. You actually create covert teams when you're when you're melding your cards. But under the hood, you know, deep deep down, it, it, it's still pandemic. if you play pandemic, you you know how to play it, and that's, that's right. one of the advantages of it. You know, the, the learning curve isn't too bad. Right. So now, um, and I know you've probably been asked this a billion times. I'm sorry, I, I don't want to try to be too samey um, or make it boring for you. Um, but when you came up with pandemic. Of course, there were the movies, right? There was Contagion or, or Infection, or there, there's been several movies about world outbreaks and pandemics. Outbreak, I think, was one of them, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but now that we're actually living through a, an actual real pandemic, what do you think you may have added to the game? And, and, and I want to know like your thoughts about if ever this could have been a possibility or you were just making a game from movies and stuff, because none of us have ever li actually lived through it, right? Since 1918 was the actual mm -hmm. real one. So was it, so I don't know, I'm sorry if my question's a little all over the place, but is there something from what we've learned, what's going on right now that you think, man, I could have maybe put that in the game to add a little bit more realism or maybe a different mechanic? Yeah, it's a tricky question. I, I think, um, I, there's certainly things I, I, I could have put in, uh, but the game really, is an abstraction. It's it's not a. It doesn't attempt to be a simulation. I've always tried to have a certain amount of distance. Um, I I cooked it up after uh, the SARS uh, epidemics back in two thousand four. We're very much in the news, and so I modeled after that. And some reading I had read the the hot zone and seen you know um, yeah you, know, you draw from fiction as well things as crazy as like twelve monkeys and and so on. Um, but I always wanted there to be uh, some distance. I didn't want the game to feel like you had to wash your hands after you played it. I wanted to have kind of a clinical look. I didn't want to name the diseases out of respect for anybody who had suffered from any any specific ones. So um, that abstraction is actually kind of important to me. I don't want there necessarily to be like cards that reflect current world events. And if it gets too realistic, um, 
I don't know, it may, may interfere to some extent. Like there, there's no uh, border closures and there's not a whole lot of politics in the, uh, hardly at all in, in the board game. It, it's, it's pretty right. high level and it's really, it's geared toward trying to make a really good player experience and yep. have enough modeling in it to, to engage you in and basically scare the crap out of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that it does, because it is hard. The first, And I've heard people are like, oh, we played the first time we won. And I was like, did you, you play it right? Well, <laughs> did you play it right? Because it is fun, but in, in it, you do get so much satisfaction when you do finally uh, are able to beat the game. So it, it's really, really good. Um, but also, Matt, I just want to know a little bit uh, about you as well. So where where are you from? I'm originally from Minnesota. I uh, grew up in the Midwest, um, went to school in the Chicago area, and then I moved out to California in 97. So I've been here uh, over 20 years now. Okay. And so did you say um, 2008 was pandemic? Was that yeah, that's when it was published. I started working on it around 2004. Okay. So what was your previous career? What did you do before? Yeah, I did user experience design. So tried to make uh, software usable by humans, <laughs> I guess is the simplest way to put it. So your background is, is uh, like tech in IT or something? or? Uh, well, actually, my, I went to school for uh, graphic design, visual communications, and okay. then did that for a couple of years in Chicago. And then the web started to blow up. And I gradually kind of moved my um, area of focus from just visual design into interaction design and user experience, basically all the different elements of how you experience uh, uh, product or service. Um, a lot of it was uh, done with Silicon Valley companies like AOL and Yahoo and Netscape, like early internet companies. And that's what brought you out west to Silicon Valley. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I got a job at Claris, which is like part of Apple Computer at the time. Oh, okay. So what was your gaming experience or your gaming life like um, during that time, maybe even back in Minnesota when you were growing up? Um, were you a big gamer? And what did you bring with you out to uh, the West Coast? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been playing games since I was a little kid. Um, uh, just loved them. They're my favorite thing. Uh, and uh, when I got to be a teenager, I started kind of dabbling in game design, uh, first kind of modifying games that I found kind of suboptimal, and then started making my own um, games. I, I started creating them after playing some games that my uncle had made, and then we started collaborating together on various uh, board games that were just, you know, homebrew. Uh, no, no thought of publishing, just just because it was a lot of fun. And then I gradually, when I went into college, I, I started to have this idea that maybe someday I could get a game published. So I started to okay. take my graphic design training and, and try to make games look good and, and, and play well. And gradually, um, I worked that into a career. But uh, yeah. coming up to California, um, I'm trying to think. In the Midwest, I, I played uh, um, Catan in 95, and that, that just kind of opened my eyes to this whole world. But I had played games like Civilization and Acquire and uh, the sort of like 3M games before with my, with my dad and uncle. So I was, I was very much into that space already. It's just that Catan was just sort of like, I think it cracked it open for everybody. Yeah, I, I think so too. Um, so do you have a family? Yeah, yeah. I've got a wife and uh, two kids. Wife and two kids. And you now are a full-time game designer, right? Yeah, for six years. Uh, it was July 4th, uh, six years ago. <laughs> that was when I, uh, when I started uh, doing this full-time. July 4th. So 2014? Yeah, that's right. It was my Independence Day. <laughs> oh, what's, your, what's your Independence Day? So, so here's an interesting question. Um, again, because you know, like all of us, and I'm going to say all of us, I'm just going to go ahead and make that statement. People who are like hardcore gamers, we all have a prototype or two or 17 sitting around the house somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but, and a lot of us, of course, would love to be able to do it full time, make games, get games designed. But that's surprising to me because it seems like if Pandemic got published in 2008 to 2014, it was such a big success, you would like would be able to make so much money, but you continued your job. So, um, and again, I don't want exact numbers or anything, but mm -hmm. that period from 2008, because of course you don't get money instantly, to 2014, so that six year period, was it a matter of, you maybe weren't making enough financially to fully become a game designer, or you were happy doing both? It's a little bit of both. Um, I think more on the, oh, geez, which one? Um, so I live in Silicon Valley. It's really expensive real estate uh, out here in the Bay Area. And employers give you all sorts of things like health insurance. And um, my wife is uh, working uh, as an independent contractor. So it, it, was, it was handy to have someone um, 
you know, with a full-time gig. Uh, also, I mean, it's hard to depend on a royalty check when you're getting it like four times a year and you don't know how much it's going to be. So there's a lot of considerations there. Like, is this going to continue? Um, is it going to be enough? Um, uncertainty and then, you know, underlying expenses. So it's a lot to, a lot to weigh. So I, I uh, originally, um, for the first, I don't know, I'm trying to think, for maybe like two months or so, I started just taking Fridays off. So I worked Monday through Thursday. And then Fridays were game design just to see how that felt. And that felt great. So gradually, um, we looked at the numbers and saw that I could make the transition. Okay. Full time. Yeah. So I, I, again, I, as much information as you want to give, because I know a lot of viewers, a lot of people, again, would love to do this full time. So can you maybe give us a little bit of discussions, how it went with your wife as far as the, the talks? Okay, honey, I really want to do this. I think we're making enough money. Are we making enough money? All that. What, what were some of the discussions that you had before you're like, okay, boom, this is now my new career. Yeah, I mean, at a high level, that was pretty much it, like looking at it and going, okay, well, this is uh, how much time I'm spending doing this activity. This is what it's bringing in. And then I'm doing my day job for, um, you know, this many days out of the week. And this is what that's bringing in. And then you kind of weigh them out and go, do you think we could make this work? And, you know, how are we going to cover those things that a company typically covers, like like health insurance and so on? Right. right, right. And then we kind of looked at the balance sheet and said, okay, let's uh, let's give it a shot. Okay, but now was you're very fortunate because pandemic is now sort of a standard or evergreen. So did that factor into your decision that you're like, yeah. you know what? This I'm pretty sure ever pandemic's going to be around for a long time, so I can guarantee I know I'm going to be getting this every quarter or something. It took a long time to get there. I mean, um oh, yeah, 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 I yeah. mean now we look at it and go like it's an evergreen, but um you never know, you know. I mean, you, it, you look at some games and they, they get really popular and then they drop off. Um, so I, I spoke with one person who was demoing um, Pandemic at a convention, and they said, "No, no, Pandemic's like a, a really good tan. It'll take a while for it to fade." And that, that actually, that metaphor uh, helped a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I did a lot of uh, projections and, and just trying to, you know, trying to convince yourself that this isn't going to disappear because it's it's scary, you know, not knowing what the what's going to come in. Um, quarter to quarter. Oh yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, but now of course you're getting what 20 different checks every quarter because each game brings you in a certain amount of a, a royalty, correct? Yeah, I think it's important to know that if you want to go independent, I mean one consideration is like can you build up a portfolio of IP that um uh is stable enough to to basically uh, keep keep you going, keep keep the engine running. Um, it's difficult. Um, I mean, I talked with Rob uh, Davio about this a, a bunch. I mean, he he worked in games for a long time at Hasbro, but didn't actually own the IP. And so when he went independent, he was kind of starting with this, you know, starting a, li a little bit colder. He had all this experience, but um, it helps if you're going to try to attempt to do this for a living to have um, have a catalog of IP that you can draw from, draw the royalties from going going forward. And that's part of the reason why I took like you know. I don't know, was it six years before I was able to do it? And yeah. I want to I want to stress that it was phenomenally lucky. I mean, this isn't just due to skill. I think I had the right product at the right time. And oh, it just took oh. off. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I you know, I mean, I I feel very fortunate I'm able to do this full time. It's it's a very difficult business to do. Um, and I think I think you know, there, there's certainly some skill involved, but a lot of it is is timing and luck. Oh no, absolutely, and and I would agree with that because Alan Moon said the same thing about Ticket to Ride. Of you know, he, yeah. they, he feels very lucky. But the truth of the matter is, again, it's 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 the hard work. You know, you're you're not an overnight success. You put in the time, you put in the effort, you built up to where you are. And yeah, it's lucky, but you had a good product, so the product speaks for itself. So it's a little luck, I guess, right? But I mean, it, well, yeah, I mean, you need to have a product there in order yes. to, to to be lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? Um, are some of the different things that you've done? Cause I know like, uh, you did Nitwit and <laughs> yeah. Era and, um, the space, uh, force, or, I'm sorry, or, uh, was it, um, space escape space. Escape. Really yeah. So what, what are some of the other kind of mechanics or genres that you ventured out into and maybe why, or what, what attracted you to them to sort of step away from your bread and butter, the cooperative games? 
Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I like designing all kinds of games. It just happened that I got a lot of success with Pandemic, which led to a lot of opportunities for doing co-ops. And I do enjoy them, but, you know, I, I, I enjoy designing all sorts of things. Uh, for one reason, it just lets me stretch and try other things out. So um, I've done some work on uh, dexterity games. Uh, the Era series has been really fun because it allows me to work, make things really tactile and, and work in 3D um, and really play with the toy-like nature of, of pieces. Um, so I've got these, uh, where is it over here? <laughs> these big prototypes that are very involved, take a long time to, to build, but when you're, when you're playing them, they're very rewarding in a, in a different kind of way. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, if you look at Space Escape, uh, that was really about looking to see how young could I go with a, a co-op game. So that's targeted ages uh, seven and up. Um, yeah, and then uh, going all the way back to Roll Through the Ages, uh, that was uh, an early roll and write, you know, um, came out uh, the year after pandemic. And mm. that was like, I, I love the game Civilization uh, as a kid, but I don't have uh, nine to 12 hours to play it. So I'm, uh, the challenge uh, that my friends and I set out for ourselves was, you know, can we design a Civilization-based game using dice uh, that plays in about 40 minutes? And so that was the result of that little competition we had and um, really enjoy uh, making dice games as well. Right, right. So I, so I want to know about the family a little bit. Uh, okay. And what I mean by that is um, there's a couple of well, a lot of things I want to know. You know, like to know, we would like to learn about the family. But when I was speaking to Alan Moon, he told me because I asked him sort of the same question about how his mother um, went to one of her women things or something. It was a lunch or a brunch or something, and one of her friends brought up, "Oh yeah, we played this game, Ticket to Ride." She's like, "That's my son!" Like you know, she was. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. So uh, a couple of questions about how does the family feel like, do they think you have a real job? Like your parents and family, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I make board games. Like when, when was the point or how did they realize that? Yeah, this is an actual profession. Oh yeah. I should ask him. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, they, they certainly know? see me like slaving away at the computer all day. So um, well, I, I, I think they, they realize I'm doing work. Uh, right. But are, I mean, do they know what you've done and do they brag about it? Are they proud of it? Like what happens? Oh, God, no, 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 no. Uh, I think, um, uh, thank God my wife keeps my ego in check, which is nice. Um, and uh, no, seriously, that's important. And then uh, humility is really important when you're a game designer. Uh, and my kids, I think, you know, they're teenagers. So um, uh, yeah, they're like, okay, well, whatever. I, I, I have yet to convince uh, my youngest to play Pandemic. Um, oh, really? she's, she's played Hot Zone, so I guess that's sort of a, a pandemic version. She hasn't yeah, played I the full board game. I think it's uncool to play your dad's stuff. So, <laughs> wow, I, yeah, okay. Now, no, seriously though, Matt, it's gotta it's gotta feel good when you walk into you know a department store and you see your game. When you walk into a walk around a convention, you see dozens of people playing your games. You walk into people's houses. I mean. You, you, I mean, you got to be proud about that fact. I mean, yeah, you want to, you don't want to get too big ahead, but still, you, you've got to appreciate what you've accomplished. So yeah. your family, your family really doesn't. It's hard to say. I don't know. I mean, it, it's the the frog and the, the boiling water, right? I mean, it's it's the the temperature and the heat behind the game is gradually risen, and we celebrate our successes for sure. I mean, when right. uh, pandemic was on tabletop, we all had a big watching party and things like that. So. Um, I, yeah, I want to underplay it. We get very excited when a, a new release happens and we bring it out. And there's nothing like just opening up the the first uh, cardboard carton and pulling the game out, and it's fresh in the shrink, and you get to check it out for the first time. That's still magical. And right. uh, yeah, it's it's fun to celebrate those kinds of things with the family. Okay, and and then and then since you're since you you don't really know about the family and all that kind of stuff, but your immediate family, your wife and your kids, what does she think about it? I mean, is is like. Is like, is, is, I don't know. Cause you know, like, you know, cause I'm just, I, you know, I own a game cafe and run a board game convention. So I'm not like a doctor or a lawyer that, you know, the wives might say, Oh, my husband's a doctor or a lawyer. How does she feel about you being a designer now that you're doing this full time? Uh, I mean, it's, it's been working out pretty well. Um, I think we like the the flexibility, uh, kind of pick around hours. The commute's great, you know, just walk about six okay. feet <laughs> into, <laughs> into the office. So you work Especially these days. What's that? Is she still like a private consultant or do you work together now? Oh, no, we don't work together uh, now. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're both uh, independent. And, and it provides a, just a lot of flexibility. Oh, nice. And your kids, so if you haven't played or your oldest, I don't know if you if that's what you said, hasn't played bit can, Pandemic yet, um, do they play games at all? Do you play oh, games? Oh, yeah, yeah, Pandemic? yeah, right. Um, just different, different lighter games. Um, she'll, she plays game with her friends uh, and uh, is into gaming. It's, I think it's just something like... Um, I think my game's just um, too close to home. 
I'm not really sure. Really? Maybe someday, I'll, someday I'll get her to, to try it out. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. So do they play a lot of video games or like, cause I know a lot of kids are into video games these days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my youngest is very much into Minecraft. So I'll spend plenty of time on that and very much into that. And since, uh, speaking of that, since your background was in that space, sort of the mm -hmm. tech space a little bit, um, were you actively involved in bringing pandemic off out of cardboard into the tech world? I was pretty involved in the um, early days of the uh, pandemic app for um, iOS uh, when it, when that first came out. Um, I think it, we first brought it to uh, to the iPad, and then it went to the iPhone, and then Android, and so on. So I gave a lot of feedback on usability and rules and so on, um, and the package and you know the whole experience of the pandemic for uh, iPad version. Um, since then, yeah, I continue to give some feedback on that, but uh, that's not where my heart is. I, I, I really enjoy making the tabletop games, less on the electronic versions. Oh, okay, cool. And now uh, we just got a, a few minutes left. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. ask you a couple of kind of generic, general questions for maybe those people who are aspiring designers out in the audience. Uh, if you can just give us, you know, a couple of quick, short answers about uh, several different questions. So sure. number one, um, I know it's hard for a lot of people to just, commit. I got to do the two, four hours a day, close the door, sit at the desk, design, design, design. Is there any kind of, and I know everybody's different. I, I, I get that. But is there like sort of a basis that you could say, hey, you, sh you should or may want to at least do this X amount of times a week, X amount of times a day, or something to kind of get people in a groove? Ah, uh, hmm, interesting. Um, Trying to think what I mean. Uh, there's there's hacks I do for myself. I mean, one is like when I kick off a project, I try to understand what the goals of it are, and then try to understand what success means. So I just have like this this light off in the distance as to where I'm going. Uh, that helps to kind of guide you, so you know where you're heading, and you're not like weaving all over the place. But often those those goals are way too big, and they're um, they feel overwhelming, and so. Uh, one trick is just to break down the project into smaller tasks or phases and then take that phase and break it down into smaller little pieces and then break that small piece into like ridiculously small tasks so that at the beginning of the day, you just write down a few of those things just to get you started because uh, starting is often the hardest part. So I'll write down, I've got a to-do list I write on a piece of college um, loose leaf, uh, college rule loose leaf paper with a the same mechanical pencil every day. And I write down like take a sh take a shower, you know, uh, journal. And um, then I've got the smallest tasks I need to complete uh, because it gives me this feeling of momentum that I'm getting things done. And and that's uh, one way to get, kind of get the flywheel going. Uh, so that's that's one design hack, I guess. No, and that's, that's a good point because a lot of people say that is just to do it or do something. So yeah. is that one of probably one of the main things you may recommend is that at the end of the day, instead of maybe just writing down a dozen, a dozen ideas, a hundred ideas, whatever, get something done, cut out a couple of pieces of paper, get a little prototype, get a little bit of playable thing, whether it works or not, but just get something done. Would you say that's a really good way to just kind of get that momentum going as you alluded yeah, to? Yeah, a number of things that are related to that. I mean, one is like, so have the goal, figure out the tasks you need to get there and then do one small thing. Uh, but if we're looking at the small things, I mean, some of the most impactful things you can do early on is to make the prototype and get it on the table and experiment with it. If you spend all your time in the notebook, just navel gazing and theory crafting, uh, that may be rewarding, but you may actually be avoiding the hard work, which is, um, it's tough. I mean, a lot of R&D is uh, setting up little experiments that are going to fail. And you just need to start with a crappy game and make it slightly less crappy over and over again until you finally get something that's actually working. <laughs> that can be really liberating. Just give yourself permission to make something quickly uh, that's really ugly and not working. And right. know that it's going to be really ugly and it's not going to be working. And then you can maybe make it work, uh, not work slightly less. <laughs> right, right. There you go. There you go. Um, so also, so last but not least, so Pandemic Legacy, folks, is is um, unquestionably the hottest and or the most anticipated Legacy Season Zero, I'm sorry, is uh, uh, the most anticipated game coming out this year. So it will be coming out soon. And I know it's going to be a great success. People are going to buy it. The reviews have been nothing but stellar. But can you maybe tell us uh, what... Matt Leacock has coming up on the future. What are some other projects that you may have going on? Yeah, I got a lot. I, I'm unfortunately, I um, 
I'm going to be annoying and say I can't really talk a lot about them. I, I can. You mentioned Pandemic Le Legacy Season Zero. Uh, the other product that's coming up uh, really quickly is the um, uh, Era Medieval Age uh, came out last year, and we've got a brand new box, uh, the Era Medieval Age expansion, which will have a, a whole lot of other buildings that you can add to it. So the, the game is kind of like a big Lego set, and then you pull a subset of Legos and build a scenario. And each time you you play, you build this these beautiful little sculpted medieval towns. So keep an eye out for that. That should be due this fall. Okay. And I know you can't give give stuff out, and I'm not going to kind of pressure you or, or tell you to. Um, but the, the one question I would like to maybe ask um, because getting lightning in a bottle is, is, of course, hard. You know, that one mechanic, that one new thing. Is anything that you have in the future or coming out, can you maybe even tell us, wow, this is something really different, unique, or is it maybe a different play? Or can you give us maybe any little thing about what it may be? I, well, I can tease that I, I have been working on a dexterity game for like four years, and I'm really okay. excited about that. I don't know when it's going to see the market, so I don't want to build up too much hype, but I, I've just been having a lot of fun with it. And, uh -huh. um I've been finding working on that really rewarding in a way that I never would have expected. Maybe that's something you can get your kids to play. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, cool. they they both play that, and we all oh. really enjoy that quite a bit. So I really hope to see that on the table before too long. And they're actively involved in your play testing. Yeah, yeah. My eldest actually has done a fair amount of development on that. Um, oh nice! It's really fun. Uh, you know, just bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, they're really good at math, so you know, I can I can. <laughs> Had a hand a sketch and say, "Hey, what's wrong with this?" and get feedback. It's it's pretty great. Uh huh. And has she? Because you, she's uh, your oldest one, right? Yeah, my oldest. Has she? Has she um, ever had an inkling or of maybe designing her own game? Uh, a little bit. Um, I, I have to say that uh, a little bit more development minded. Uh, my my youngest is probably a little bit more design oriented. Okay. Just like uh, you know, more gestural, big big idea sort of thing. And then if I want, I'm looking for like input on balance and lots of questions about why did you do that? That doesn't look right. Then yeah, I go to my oldest. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you have a fantastic family. It's so great to have uh, kids who you're able to help design and play test and all that kind of stuff. That must feel uh, really, really good. I mean, you've been Especially times like this. Yeah. When we can't get out. Yes, no kidding, right? Yes. Um, so last but not least, Matt, what I'd like you to do is uh, take a minute or two and just let the folks know uh, anywhere and everywhere they can go and find everything Matt Leacock, your Instagram, Twitter, oh, Facebook, sure. uh, website, and all that kind of stuff, okay? Yeah, I'm, at, uh, I'm on Twitter at, um, sorry, I think it, sorry, let me start that over again. I'm, at, I'm, on, I'm on Twitter at, at Matt Leacock. I think it's the double at that threw me there. I'm on Facebook. Um, I think it's matt.leacock. You can just search for me on Facebook. And then um, you can find um, my catalog of games. And I've got a blog that I periodically open, uh, periodically update at leacock.com. Oh, fantastic. All right. Well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And uh, we learned a lot. I hope it was a little bit different for you. Um, yeah, you know, get some different things in there. But, yeah, totally. Yeah, thank you for spending the time. And, you know, it might be nice to have you. Uh, I don't, who knows what's going to happen this year with Dice Tower West, but maybe in the years to come, it'd be nice to have you out there as a guest to uh, maybe spend some time with us at the convention. Yeah, send me an invite. Thanks we'll for having me, Tim. Good. All right, thank you very much, Matt. We'll talk to you soon. All right, take care. I'll be, don't leave. I'll be right back in just a minute, okay? Well, there you go, folks. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of Meepleville Meets. Matt Leacock, the designer of Pandemic. We've got more episodes for you coming up. A lot of great interviews on the way. So thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.